Good afternoon. Good to see everybody. You doing okay? Yeah. All right, very good. You made it through the traffic? <coughs> Holy cow. <laughs> wow. I left my hotel. It's like 5.15. I thought I'm doing good. I'll get there early. Got here at 5.45. <laughs> but, uh, hey, I got here. Praise God. Uh, I had a really good day today. I had a good time this morning. Talking about some beautiful stuff for the kids. And tonight, I look forward to tonight's two talks. It's just a lot of fun. Uh, before we get to that, I thought I'd show you a little bit about the Creation Museum. In case you've never been, I'll show you a little video about what the museum's all about, what it kind of looks like, give you a little kind of taste of what it is, uh, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about dinosaurs after that. What do you say? Okay. All right, yeah, here we go. So here's the video about the museum. The acclaimed Creation Museum and outreach of Answers in Genesis is a one-of-a-kind museum filled with animatronic characters interactive special effects theater, and many other world-class exhibits. Since its opening in 2007, the Creation Museum has welcomed over 1.5 million guests at its 49-acre location in the greater Cincinnati area. The state-of-the-art 70,000-square-foot museum brings the pages of the Bible to life, helping answer the skeptical questions that cause people to doubt that the Bible is true. The dramatic finale of the museum is the last Adam film, where guests experience the glory of God's redemptive plan and hear a clear and powerful presentation of the gospel message. Since the museum's opening, we have heard countless testimonies from adults and young people whose lives have been changed through a museum visit. Now discover how it might change your own life for Christ. Plan your visit at creationmuseum.org and prepare to believe. Dinosaurs. 
And when we do that, we have answers. Because remember, the Bible gives us the big picture of history. It gives us the right understanding of the past that we apply to the evidence in the present. And then we get to my dinosaurs and use real observational science to confirm that those biblical glasses are correct. Because as we said often and many times now, this is ultimately a what issue? World view. It's a hard issue. It's a worldview issue. Absolutely. If you start with the wrong assumptions, you get the wrong conclusions. Everyone comes to the evidence with a worldview. That's really what this is all about. I'll give you one more story to, to kind of back this up. It's a fun story. It's about a guy who thought he was dead. He thought it was dead. He was pretty sad about that. You can't blame him. Who wants to be dead like that? So he went to the doctor. He said, hey, doc, I've got a problem. I'm dead. And the doctor looked down kind of funny. He said, well, you just walked into my office and you're talking to me. And the guy said, yeah, but you know when you die, your muscles can twitch for a while. So maybe that's why you still walk and talk. The doctor said, okay, well, I've got your medical chart right here. It says you're perfectly healthy. And the guy said, well, who knows if you're reading that correctly. And maybe somebody swapped it out when you weren't looking. Maybe that's not even my chart. The doctor was getting frustrated, thought for a second, he said, I got it. He asked the guy, do dead men bleed? The guy thought for a second, your heart stops beating, blood doesn't circulate. No, dead men don't bleed. He said, very good. So the doctor grabs the needle, pricks the guy on the finger, sure enough, blood comes out. The guy looks at his finger and says, wow, how about that? Dead men do bleed. <laughs> Did the doctor have evidence? Yeah, absolutely. Did the guy find the evidence convincing? No, because his worldview taught him to interpret each line of evidence to fit his preconceived ideas. We already talked about a great example of this was the issue of the age of the earth. Again, up to the late uh, 1700s, most scientists believed the Bible thought the earth was just thousands of years old. What changed their mind? What evidence did they find? Nothing. Nothing. They just got a new worldview, a new way to interpret the same evidence. Instead of believing Noah's flood laid down Moses' rock list, they said maybe all these rock lists were laid down slowly with just natural processes. If we give those natural processes enough what? Time. And that's where the idea of length of years came from. And from that point down, the majority of the scientific community adopted that naturalistic worldview. And why did they choose to adopt that worldview? Well, obviously, they wanted to free science from Moses. Get God out of science. And this is much of a review from the other session. But the point is, from that point in time, they adopted this worldview. And here's the thing. Once you start looking at the world in a particular way, it can be almost impossible to see it in any other way. In a real sense, you can get brainwashed. You ever been brainwashed before? Anybody? A couple of us. Dude, we're friends now, right? <coughs> Can I brainwash you? Are you guys cool with that? <coughs> I'll take that as a yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to tell you guys a story. At the end of the story will be two questions. If you know the answers to the two questions, the specific answers, you have not been brainwashed. Congratulations. But if you don't know, I brainwashed you. I got you to think the way I want you to think, and you probably have no idea how it happens, and I will bet it happens in the very first sentence. You ready? So if you know the answer, don't yell it out. Just raise your hand when I ask. Here's the story. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. He jogged a little ways and turned left, jogged a little ways and turned left, jogged a little ways and turned left, and he jogged back home. As he was jogging back home, he noticed two masked men were waiting for him at home. Who were the masked men, and why did he leave home jogging? Anybody know the answers to those two questions? Raise your hand. One, two, so, three, couple. So, around 98% have been brainwashed. Congratulations. Feel good? No, it feels awful, right? But I'll give you one more shot, just to be fair. So I'll just talk a little faster. Here we go. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. He jogged a little ways and turned left. Give me a hint, left is important. He jogged a little ways turned left, jogged a little ways turned left, and he jogged back home. As he was jogging back home, he noticed two masked men were waiting for him at home. Again, who were the masked men and why did he leave home jogging? Anybody knew did it? Anybody knew? Couple. All right. So 96% have been brainwashed. I feel pretty good about myself. All right. But now, don't worry. I'm going to unbrainwash you. And I'm going to do it with a simple picture. And when you see this picture, you'll probably kick yourself or your neighbor and think, why could I not figure this out? It's so easy. You ready? Once upon a time, a man left home. Yeah. <laughs> he jogged the ways from left, jogged the ways from left, jogged the ways from left, and he jogged back home. The two masked men, of course, were the good old catcher and the umpire. Isn't that so easy? Absolutely. Why could you not figure that out? Well, probably because when I said he left home, what did you think of? A house. Jogging for some exercise. The masked men were probably bad guys or robbers. And notice this. Once you started interpreting those words in that particular way, it was almost impossible to see them in any other way. In a real sense, you were brainwashed. Can I show you how multiple generations now, 
kids today are in that same way, being brainwashed. Give them a book like this. Because I can read about the dinosaurs. And what do you think are the first words in the book? You guys have this book too. All right. <laughs> yeah. Millions of years ago. Here's another one. Millions of years ago. Even the beloved Dr. Seuss. Not the first words, but right there. Millions of years ago. This idea, of course, is everywhere related to dinosaurs, especially. Went to Disney World a few years ago with my family. You know, the Magical Kingdom. Went to the Animal Kingdom one day. We visited Dino Land. And when we visited Dino Land, that day wasn't magical for me. Because as we walked around, I saw stuff like this. You can ride a roller coaster, go back 65 million years in time, and catch a dinosaur. Or go to the bone yard and dig up critters representing things millions of years old. Or walk around this trail representing the world as it was millions of years ago. Or think about it like this. Meet little Joey. There he is. He's five years old. He's about to start school, public, private, homeschool. doesn't matter. And he already knows about evolution, Big Bang, dinosaurs lived millions of years ago, people who bought from apes. He knows all that already. How? I want you to meet his teachers. You might know Hey, full disclosure, just to be completely honest, um, you know, Ian's just 15 months, you know, he's really young, but sometimes you got his cartoons on TV or whatever, and my wife was reporting him the other day, he was doing something really cute like he always does, and so she was reporting him as he was doing it, and in the background the TV was going, and I couldn't see the screen, but I could hear the TV, and you know what I heard as she was reporting him? Well, about 65 million years ago, during the blah, 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 <laughs> I'm not taking my camera arms out, that's the back, uh, but no, this stuff is literally everywhere. These things appear so cute and harmless, but guys, as they watch these shows one after another, I fear we have forgotten a very important truth, and that is this. We are not the only fishermen. We're not. And for the seculars, dinosaurs are one of the primary baits they use to reel our kids into that secular worldview that essentially says the Bible's history is incorrect. If you can't believe what the Bible says about history, once again, why what it says about salvation. Bottom line. And that's why some are ready to give an answer for the hope that we have, even answers about dinosaurs. Ready to get some? All right, let's do it. On which day were they created out of the six days? Yeah, day six. We know, right? Because, look, in this picture, there are two T-Rexes. That proves it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think about it, why did we put two T-Rexes in that picture? Does the Bible tell us when God made the T-Rex specifically? No, but can we figure it out with some basic logic? Yeah, it's not that hard, right? So, for example, T-Rex is a land animal. Everybody agree? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, just to be technical, dinosaurs by definition are land animals with a certain hip structure. Technically, things like the swimming reptiles, the chronosaurs, the plesiosaurs, stuff like that are not technically dinosaurs. And the flying reptiles, the pterodactyls, the ramphorhynchus, those things are not technically dinosaurs either. Usually associated, but technically dinosaurs are land animals. So, T-Rex is one as well. And the Bible says land animals were created on day six. True? Yeah. True. Therefore, T-Rex was created on day six. Who can figure that out with no help at all? <laughs> it's not hard, right? And, you know, here's the thing. Again, the Bible is not a science textbook. It doesn't give us every detail. It doesn't list every name of every animal ever created. And I, for one, am glad about that. Could you imagine reading that? Right? <laughs> Who's read through Leviticus or Numbers? <laughs> right? That's hard enough, okay? I'm just glad there's not a list of the animals. And plus, we got proof positive that dinosaurs lived with Adam in the garden. Here's a picture that Eve took in case you guys are wondering. <laughs> now, I have to be honest. For you deep thinkers, this is a post-fall photo. But I can't show a pre-fall photo to a post-fall audience. I hope you guys understand that. If you don't, don't worry about it. Oh. <laughs> So people say, wait, but if God made dinosaurs on these six, then why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? And it's true, the word dinosaur is not in the Bible. Neither is the word email, right? And anyone has email as it came after the curse, amen? But uh, anyway, it's not in there. The reason it's not in there is because the word dinosaur is a very new word. It was not invented until 1841. What really used that much until the early 1900s. Invented by Sir Richard Owen. It means terrible lizard. So, of course, you would not expect to find, find the word dinosaur in the early English Bibles. It had not even been invented yet. Intriguingly, though, there's another word in many of those early English Bibles that appears to be talking about dinosaurs in many cases. And that word is dragon. Translated from the Hebrew word tenim, repeated over 25 times throughout the Old Testament. One example, Psalm 74, 13, that breaks the heads of the dragons in the waters. Maybe they're about the chronosaurs or the plesiosaur or something like that. But there's also a couple of different places. In the Bible, where it appears that God describes a dinosaur in more detail than pretty much any other critter in the entire Bible. 
And that book of the Bible is? Job. Job. Very good. The book of Job. This is where God tells Job to look at behemoth. Now, the word behemoth means a monstrous beast. That's what it means. And, and God tells Job to look at behemoth. So behemoth is a real critic. And if you have a study Bible, it'll probably tell you that behemoth was maybe a hippo or an elephant. But let's see if the description given in the Bible fits up a hippo or an elephant. You go to verse 16. It says, what strength he has in his loins, what power in the muscles of his belly. In other words, behemoth has a big belly. Don't argue with elephants. They have big bellies. There they are. Hippo. He's got a big belly. This guy's got a bigger belly. He wins. He's got a big belly. I'm not sure what that proves at all. <laughs> you already saw that big belly. That's <laughs> no educational value whatsoever. All right, but anyway, okay. <laughs> Verse 17. And then it goes on to say about Behemoth, his tail sways like a cedar. What's implied there, his tail sways like a cedar tree, like a huge tree lumbering back and forth in the wind. His tail is huge, like a tree in the wind. You ever seen the tail of a hippo? Or no? <laughs> What pathetic examples of trees, all right? All right. Those are not tree tails. Those are twig tails, all right? That's what they are. So let's take a tree tail and put it on uh, a hippo. And not working out so well, right? Put it on an elephant. No, and the elephant is scared to death. What's happening back there, all right? Put it on something like a sauropod dinosaur, a long necked dinosaur, brachiosaurus, a pinosaurus, a titanosaurus, whichever one you want. Seems to fit the description really well. And that leads us to a really important kind of footnote, side note, but it's really foundational. And that's this. If you have a study Bible, your study notes and your footnotes are really important. But let's remember they're not the inspired word of God. <coughs> the text itself is the inspired <coughs> word of God. And I've heard it put like this. You don't really use your footnotes to understand your Bible. You use your Bible to understand your footnotes. And the best commentary on the Bible is always the what? The Bible itself. Absolutely. Then we move on to verse 18. It says his bones are two of bronze. His limbs are like rods of iron. And there's a toe bone of a bronchiosaurus. There's a leg bone of a bronchiosaurus. Like a rod of iron. It says he ranks first among the works of God. This is the biggest, most preeminent example of God's creative power for Job to see on land. And from all of that, what seems to be being described here is something more like this. <laughs> well, like an apatosaurus, a bronchiosaurus, a long neck dinosaur. Notice the size, the preeminence of it. Notice the tail. Swaying back and forth like a tree in the wind. And of course, that clip comes from what movie? Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park. Who's seen Jurassic Park? All right. Again, a bunch of heathens. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Who's seen all three? Anybody excited about number four? Yeah, me too. Absolutely. Just watch out. We're still trying to tell you about us when he bought from the birds. It's all that's in all of them. But anyway, all right. So that's Behemoth. And there's another critter in the book of Job. And he's called Leviathan. Now, this critter is really interesting because Leviathan is, again, supposed to be a real critter. God tells Job to look at Leviathan. And it gives us really uh, just detailed description of how powerful Leviathan is, and he's aggressive, don't mess with him. And, and then he says some interesting things about Leviathan. His sneezing throws out flashes of light. His breath throws coals ablaze, and flames dart from his mouth. So now it's not just a dragon, but it's a fire-breathing dragon. Give it away, Brian. Come on now. You guys have an answer to believe in fire-breathing critters? Well, before you discount that notion altogether, take a look at what God did with the little bombardier beetle. Known to scientists, it's the bombardier beetle. When threatened, it's the bombardier beetle. When threatened, it fires out a burning liquid at a temperature of over 200 degrees Fahrenheit, almost boiling point. It does it by pumping a liquid fuel into a reaction chamber where a catalyst ignites the mixture. The burning chemicals have nowhere to go but out and with a bang. All right. I was recently at church and somebody yelled up from the audience, I know somebody who does that. Like, that. <laughs> <laughs> not the same thing at all. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's horrible. It kills other insects, small mammals, and it's horrible to human skin. If God can do that with a little two inch beetle, what can God do with a multi ton beast like a behemoth? Or think about some of the other things that God has made that we can look at. There's so many things we can talk about, but things like lightning bugs. Aren't they cool? I mean, they produce light. Such a neat thing. Do you realize that the chemical reaction that takes place to produce light is 100% efficient? No energy is lost in the conversion. Compare that to our light, which lose 90% of their energy in the form of heat. But God's design is a little bit better than ours. Imagine that. Or things like electric eels, animals that produce electricity. Such a cool thought. And by the way, if you just found the bones of an electric eel, would you know it produced electricity? Probably not. 
Plus, besides all that, most animals produce methane, which is a flammable gas. All you need is a way to ignite it, and you have a flamethrower. Not that hard to do. And so we also have flying reptiles mentioned in the Bible as well, Isaiah 14, 29, and 30, verse 6, the flying fiery serpents. They're all over the place. And so people naturally ask, okay, well, if they're in the Bible, that makes sense. But I got a question, Brian, what they eat? You know, isn't Adam going to get a little worried when lunchtime rolls around? And that's a good question. It's a fair question. And so let's answer it. What did the original keyword, original T-Rex eat? Was he A, B, C, or D? What do you think? Hey. Hey, you guys were paying attention earlier. You heard already the answer. Absolutely A. If you weren't here, you might be saying, how do you guys know? Well, that classic Sunday school answer, because the Bible tells us so. Go to Genesis 1, 29. God told Adam and they are to eat fruit. Verse 32, all the beasts of the earth, all the birds of the air, all the creatures that move on the ground, everything with a breath of life in it. I give every green plant for food in it. So, because as we said before, originally everything was vegetarian. That makes perfect biblical sense because there was no death until after Adam's sin, which means you can't eat meat until after his sin. So originally, the T-Rex, like everything else, was vegetarian. People say, wait, well, tell me the T-Rex with the big old teeth of six inch shredded fangs, hey, things like fruits and vegetables, pineapples, so forth and so on. Absolutely. Have you guys ever tried to bite into a coconut? That's a bad idea, right? Like a redneck's famous last words, hey, y'all watch this, all right? Here we go. <laughs> Not good, all right? You need a knife to get into a coconut, right? T-Rex was simply just pre-equipped. And besides all that, if you find a fossil of a critter with big, long, sharp teeth, what is the only thing you know for sure about that critter? He's got big, long, sharp teeth, right? And by the way, there are plenty of critters today in our Genesis 3 fallen, messed up, cursed world that have big, long, sharp teeth that are either primarily or even only vegetarian. I'll give you a couple quick examples. Look at this primate from South America. Look at those teeth. You know, he's picked on in high school, right? That's rough. The guy is vegetarian. Or look at this skull. Look at those long, sharp teeth. He must be a vicious meat eater. No, that skull belongs to a fruit bat. You get one guess as to what a fruit bat eats. If you get it wrong, I'm leaving. <laughs> right, yeah, of course, he's fruit, right? Absolutely. Or look at this skull right here. Look at those big old sharp teeth in front. He must be a meat eater. No, that skull belongs to one of them. These guys. I'm not going to tell you which one. Which one of them? Let's <laughs> test. Let's see who the true heathens are in the bunch. I don't know. Okay. We'll clean it up a little bit. There we go. All right. We lost some hand to bear. All right. Or look at this skull right here. Look at those big old saber tooth like teeth. Isn't that intimidating? It's crazy. It must be a vicious meat eater. No, that skull belongs to something known as the Chinese water deer. Known as a vampire deer for obvious reasons and, of course, vegetarian. So back in the day, before Adam sinned, everything was vegetarian. You could hang out with the lions and the tigers and the bears on my would not be a problem. You could bring a T-Rex home as a pet. Not an issue. Just be sure you got enough room, right? That's the way it was, but that's not the way it is. Something has changed. What happened? What changed everything? Sin. Sin changed everything. And of course, man sin and brought death and suffering into this world. As we talked about before, God didn't create death and suffering. He made a perfect creation. Who messed up this world? Man did in our sin. We wrecked it. Because of our sin, death came into the world and the curse. And that's why we see horrific things like this. And we see immediately. We see tsunamis and tornadoes. We see cancer. We see disease because of sin. That sin affected everything. Romans 8, 22. For the whole of creation groans in pain. It wants to be fixed back to the way it was before Adam's sin. And just in case you missed the last couple of days, if you try to squeeze millions of years into the Bible, you've got all types of big theological problems. I'll give you a couple real quick. If you do that, that means God looks down on day six and calls millions of years of death and suffering and disease, like diseases like cancer, very good. And that would not be a very good God. It also means, think about it, it means he created the world with death already in it. It means he is the author of death, which would be a huge theological problem, obviously, for many reasons. But even more important than all that, if there's death for sin, death isn't the payment for sin. Right? And hopefully you guys can repeat this by now. And if death is not the payment for sin, then Jesus' death does not cover our sin debt. And again, you just destroy the foundation for the gospel. Again, that's why it's important. It's not until after the flood or after Adam's sin that the diet for dinosaurs changed. It's not until after the flood that God told Noah, just as I gave you plants to eat, now you can eat everything. So it's okay, guys, to eat flame and young wrapped in bacon. Amen? <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> I'm getting hungry right now. That's some good stuff. We can do that now. It's okay. It's not until after the flood that God gave that permission, though. 
It's not until after the flood that God told Noah, just, uh, well, not, not that, he told Noah that I'm going to put the fear and the dread of you into all the beasts of the earth. So before the flood, animals were, were not scared of man. But after the flood, animals are now scared of man. Which, if an animal is scared of you, it does one of two things. What are they? Fight yeah, fight or fly, right? One of those two things. So keep that thought in mind. Just take it, put it on the shelf over here. We'll come back and get it later on when we talk about what happened to the dinosaurs. So for some people, I get to this point, and they say, okay, Brian, that all makes sense. Uh, so here's what I'm thinking. God made dinosaurs. They were originally all good, but didn't make sin, messing up the world. Dinosaurs became maybe a threat. So maybe God just let them all die during the flood. But is that what the Bible says? Is this Genesis 7, 15? Help me out here. Uh, pairs of all creatures with the breath of life in them, except dinosaurs came to know and entered the ark. No, again, that's in second heresies or third opinions. One of those two. But it's not in your Bible. All creatures with the breath of life came to Noah and entered the ark, including, obviously, dinosaurs. And we talked about the ark last night. It was huge, but was it big enough for dinosaurs? Let's talk about that right now. First thing, people say, but wait a minute. Aren't there just thousands of different types of dinosaurs out there? Well, guys, just like there are many variations of the dog kind and many variations of the horse kind, but just the basic kinds, same thing with dinosaurs. There are many variations of the triceratops kind, but just the basic kind. Many variations of the sauropod kind, but just the basic kind. Being really generous, there are only about 50 dinosaur kinds. Time two, that's only 100 dinosaurs. Not that many. You might be saying, okay, there's not that many, but I mean, come on. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right? How do you all squeeze those things in there? Well, that leads us to a very common misconception. Do you realize that the average size of a dinosaur was that of a small horse? Yeah, most of them actually weren't that big. Some were small as chickens. Yeah, they were still around. We could have some good old KFD. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, it tastes like what? Chicken. chicken. That's exactly right. That's it. It's like chicken. Yeah. <laughs> and as it turns out, we know that all dinosaurs started off small because they hatched from eggs. And as it turns out, the max size for an egg is about the size of a football. Because the bigger the egg gets, the thicker the shell's got to be to support its own weight. But you can't let the shell get too thick because that oxygen can't get through to keep the critter alive. So the max size for an egg is about that big. That means all your dinosaurs, whether you're talking about the great stegosaurs, the T-Rex, the bronchiosaurs, they all started off fairly small and cute. I don't know about the new part, but small. All right, you get that, and whatever. And that really should not be that weird to us, because even today, crocodiles, for example, they hatch from eggs, you can hold them in the palm of your hand. Give them a few years, if you're not careful, they will hold you in the bottom of their belly, all right? And that guy's crazy, I don't know what he's doing, but anyway, there he is. And plus, remember, God brought the animals to Noah. So I'm pretty sure God's got to figure out, got to figure out which ones to bring. God to bring the biggest ones, all right? But I'm going to imagine that God brought young adults to Noah for multiple reasons. Number one, they're smaller. It's common sense, right? You don't have to bring the biggest ones. Bring young adults of the elephants, of the giraffes, of horses, of all the bigger animals. Just be sure you got a pink one and a blue one. That's a point later, all right? <laughs> young adults, they weigh less, they eat less, they sleep a lot more. Youngins are a lot tougher. Youngins run around, fall down, and bounce, and get up, and keep running, right? Adults fall down and break, <laughs> and lay there for a while. Plus, youngins will live longer after the floods, reproduce more, and that's the whole reason you are taking them to begin with. So lots of reasons to take young adults. And by the way, just to be technical, the big ones would have fit just fine, but no reason to take the biggest ones. So they were on the ark, along with everything else. And then the Bible says on that day, we talked about last night, the mountains were <laughs> great deep, first forth, cracking through the crust of the earth, literally destroying this world, turning it into a junkyard. And because of that event, we find billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water, all over the earth. And that happened around 4,400 years ago. People say, all right, well, that happened at that time, right? Then I got a question. Is there any forensic evidence that happening not that long ago? Should we find something? The guys, we find tons. You don't hear much about it because it doesn't fit the evolutionary worldview. There's so much. We could be here literally for hours or days just on this one topic. I'll just give you a few examples. For example, over in North Shore, Alaska, we have found thousands of mostly unfossilized dinosaur bones. That is, they have not turned to stone. They look and they feel like old cow bones. Secularists walked by them for 20 years because, because they thought there was nothing special about them, because they thought they were just regular bones. And as this secularist admits, bones have been turned into stone to be fossils, and usually most of the original bone is still present in a dinosaur fossil. But it gets infinitely better than that. We find in many of these bones literally hundreds of examples of things like this. Inside this triceratops bone, supposedly 65 million years old, we find 
fresh, springy, stretchy tissue. We find blood vessels inside the tissue. We find red blood cells inside the blood vessels, right? Now, this soft tissue and this stuff made is made of mostly water. It should not last hundreds of years after the death of the critter, maybe thousands. And there are hundreds of examples of this from different specimens. Now, once you notice, where did I get this from? What website? Nova. You ever heard of Nova? Not creationist, okay? If you don't know, they're really not there. I got all these from their website, so cool. Now here's a duck the dinosaur ball, supposedly 78 million years old, but the tissue is still stretching. Again, blood vessels and red blood cells. Here is, again, that T-Rex example I showed you the other night. Again, you got the uh, stretchy tissue and there's blood vessels and red blood cells. And you know, honestly, many times I think we would look at that and think, wow, that's a slam dunk, right? I mean, there's no way that stuff lasts for millions of years. It proves those fossils are just hundreds <coughs> or maybe thousands of years old, but definitely not millions. That's got to convince the evolutionists. It's got to convince the secularists that they're wrong. But will it? No. no because it's a worldview issue and it's a hard issue. Let me show you an example of this, a great example. Mary Schweitzer on this next clip, she's the very nice lady who discovered this particular specimen. And she's approaching the evidence from an evolutionary worldview. I want you to watch how her worldview dictates how she interprets what she's looking at and, and realize the conclusion that she reaches as she does that. There you go. Not going to believe this. When she picked up a small piece to stop the reaction by putting it in water, it stretched and it sproinged and it moved all over the place. So we knew we had something pretty unusual. It appears to be soft tissue. When they look at neighboring parts of the bone, they're even more surprised. Out popped the blood vessels, and they were pretty incredible. And I said, I don't believe it. That's not possible. We need to do it again and again. It's one of those just goosebump-inducing scientific moments. That's all I can say. And I, they don't really happen very often. Blood vessels should not exist in fossilized bone. Many scientists believe organic molecules can't last more than 100,000 years. Yet Schweitzer's bone is 68 million years old. I think the presence of soft tissues and cells indicates there's a process going on that we didn't have a clue about. So I think it means that we have to kind of rethink the whole chemical process of making a bone turn into a fossil. Wait, what? <laughs> Don't rethink the age. Now that's set in stone for a really bad pun. All right, no, that's that's it. We can't change that. No, no, no. There must be some natural process. Now think about it. That we have never, ever observed that is somehow making these things last for millions of years. How fast was that cat going? It is a worldview issue, absolutely. I think the Bible offers a much better explanation for why we find fresh tissue. They're just not that old. Most of them died during the flood around 4,350. Years ago. And so if that's the case, that means some dinosaurs were, of course, on the ark, right? If they got off, must, that means they must have lived with man. But if they lived with man after the flood, should we not find some historical written documentation of dinosaurs living with man? And indeed, we should. And indeed, we do. But remember the word dinosaur? New word. Not have been until 1841, not used until the early 1900s. But there's another word in pretty much every culture all around the world that appears to be talking about dinosaurs. And what's that word? Dragon. It is dragons. It is literally everywhere in the honest secularist knows this. Watch this clip from the Discovery Channel. There is one creature remembered in the legends of almost every human culture that's ever existed. A creature depicted with remarkable similarity by the Chinese, the Aztecs, even the Inuit, who live in a frozen land where no reptiles are found, even they have stories of this animal. The dragon. Cultures from different continents, people who had no contact with one another, yet all of them have stories describing the same mythical animal. Could it be these stories were more than myth? What if we discovered that this creature that haunts our imagination had once been real? so much fun, these legends all around the world. We could literally, again, be here for days or weeks talking about just this one subject. Just give you a few quick examples. Uh, St. George is said to have slayed a dragon around 275 AD. It's supposed to be a real event. And the description of that dragon is that of a dinosaur known as a baryonyx. And it just so happens in that same area we find bones of baryonyx. Huh, that's interesting. 
Or in France, there's a city in, renamed in honor of the dragon that was killed there. It was described as being bigger than an ox with long, sharp, pointed horns on its head. It was like a triceratops. Or Marco Polo in 1271 AD reported that the emperor of China used dragons to pull his chariots in his parades. Which, by the way, if I was an emperor and there were dragons around, they pull my chariots too because that is awesome, all right? It's good stuff. We got historians like Aristotle and Herodotus reported seeing flying dragons. Herodotus said he went to go see these winged serpents, these flying dragons, as they were flying for Egypt, as they were known to do. And he saw them. And he said they were like water snakes. They were reptilian. And he said their wings were membrane. It's like the wings of a bat. Their wings were not feathered. The Astoria Animalia, a very well-known old secular science book, said that dragons were not extinct in the 1500s. They were still around, but were rare by then and relatively small. And then we see drawings and carvings all over the world, what appears to be dinosaurs with man. I'll give you a few examples of those. In Egypt, here's a piece of Egyptian pottery. It seems to show two long-necked dinosaurs. Here's an ancient Roman mosaic from the 2nd century AD. Again, two long-necked dinosaurs. Or go over to England, visit Carlisle Cathedral, see the tomb of Bishop Bell, died around 1500. There are brass strips around this tomb and carvings of animals on, that, on those brass strips. And some of those carvings look like no types of dinosaurs. Or go to Cambodia, built this temple built around a thousand years ago. Zoom in on the column of this temple. We have what appears to be a very clear depiction of a stegosaurus, the dinosaur with the plates on the back. Now, I hope you notice we're just kind of going around the world. Uh, here's a, pic a pictogram of what appears to be maybe a triceratops, big body, three horns. The secularists look at that and say, no, it's just a goat. The Indians are bad artists. But if you look above, the Indians know what a goat looks like, all right? <laughs> They're confused. They've got that down. <laughs> you go just down the road over in Utah. Here's a very clear depiction of a sauropod dinosaur. You've got the long tail, the four legs, the body, the long neck, and the head. It's very clear. It's unambiguous. And this honest scientist says, yeah, you know, it looks like a dinosaur. I don't know what to do with it. It doesn't fit my evolutionary worldview, but it looks like a dinosaur. And down the road from there, we find a cave drawing of what appears to be a pterodactyl of some sort with the features of the bump on the head, the feet, and so forth. Here's another cave wall drawing of a long-necked dinosaur, and it could not be more clear. Here's one that's pretty interesting. This is a critter the aboriginals drew. They called it Yaru. They said Yaru was a real creature. Now this picture is kind of sad because evidently Yaru ate one of their friends. Right? <laughs> Which is really sad and funny at the same time. I'm not sure how that works. But, and so they're going to get revenge on Yaru or try to get the friend back. I'm not sure which. But they said Yaru was a real critter. And Yaru looks just like something called a plesiosaur usually associated with dinosaurs. And literally, I went fast, but we could be here just for hours going through so many other legends. It's so cool. They're literally everywhere. So many of you can talk about. And you know what? The honest scientist, the honest secularist, knows these legends are there and needs to deal with them. And some have tried. Have you ever heard of Carl Sagan? Mm -hmm. You know him? So, okay. Uh, if you know who he was, he, he was an evolutionist, uh, Atheist, definitely not a Christian, not a believer, uh, and uh, he believes staunchly in evolution. And he said, you know what? He admitted, yeah, these dragon legends, they're all around the world, and yes, they sound like dinosaurs. So he's thinking, how do I explain this from an evolutionary perspective? Because we know man didn't live with dinosaurs. That's impossible. They lived millions of years ago, in his mind. So how do we explain this from an evolutionary worldview? And he wrote a book called The Dragons of Eden to try to explain why he's seen these legends. And this was a theory he came up with and presented in his book. He said, well, since evolution is true and everything evolved from a common ancestor, and humans somewhere along the way evolved from dinosaurs, then maybe some humans in the past had a latent vestigial that is leftover memory of when they used to be dinosaurs tucked away somewhere in the back of their head. And then sometimes at night when they would go to sleep, that memory would kick in in their dreams, and they would see the dinosaurs that they used to see a dying, you know, back in the day. They would see the dinosaurian world. They would see all these great images, and then they would wake up, and they would draw what they saw, or write about what they saw. Sounds good. Now, here's a quote from his book. He said, In the dreams of humans, the dragons can be heard hissing and rasping, and the dinosaurs thunder still. Wow. Again, that is the power of a worldview. And by the way, he won the Pulitzer Prize for that book, just in case you were wondering. I think the Bible offers a much better, much clearer explanation for the dinosaurs. And of course, that leads us to this. People say, all right, Brian, that all makes sense, but here's the big question. So what everybody wants to know, what happened to them? I'm going to tell you. You ready? It's about to get deep. <laughs> That's right. They died, all right? 
Uh, now, as to why they died, we'll get to that here in a second. But what's interesting is the evolutionists have multiple theories as to what happened to the dinosaurs, right? Some think they did not die at all, not really. They just evolved into birds. And as we talked about during the very first session on Sunday morning, that's impossible. But because to change a dinosaur into a bird, you have to add brand new genetic information over time. Natural selection mutations mix up and reduce genetic information they don't add brand new information. Some think that an asteroid or meteorite hit the Earth and killed all the dinosaurs, big and small, but left everything else alive, which is a neat trick, all right? Some think the dinosaurs died of indigestion, and we admit indigestion is painful, no doubt. And this next one is a real theory. I'm not making this up. You can't make this up. Some scientists believe that dinosaurs gassed themselves into extinction. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, the truth. They flagellated so much. It put so much methane into the atmosphere, caused a greenhouse effect, increased the temperature of the earth, and the dinosaurs could not stand the heat. I don't know what to do with that theory. <laughs> if you'll indulge me just a little, it does give new meaning to the phrase silent but deadly. But other than that, I don't know. Sorry. Um, some think dinosaurs overrate, some think they starve to death, some think a natural catastrophe of some sort killed the dinosaurs. Maybe this is the real reason, I don't know. Let that be a lesson that life choices have consequences, right? <laughs> Uh, or this next, this last one I'll show you. This is my favorite one. It's just my sense of humor, but I think it has a lot of explanatory power as to what happened to the dinosaurs. Makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest, Chuck Norris has been around for a long time. All right. <laughs> so, yeah, of course I'm having fun. But, you know, most secularists would agree with what I'm about to show you from National Geographic. They posted this a couple years ago. They said, uh, around 90% of all organisms that have ever lived have gone extinct in their worldview. That's a lot of extinction, by the way. And they're predicting by the year 2100, half of the existing organisms will also go extinct. And if you're looking at that, you might say, wow, there's a lot of extinction. Why is that happening? And if you were to, if you were to ask one of these experts why there's so much extinction, you'd probably get a response like this. It's not a mystery, isn't it obvious? You got people killing them, you got lack of food, man's destroying the environment, there are diseases, genetic problems, catastrophes like floods and tsunamis. It's easy to understand why they're all going to sink. It's not hard to understand. Okay, if you ask those same experts, well then what happened to the dinosaurs? Well, we don't know, that's a mystery. <laughs> Can I suggest that dinosaurs probably went extinct for some of the very same reasons so many other critters go extinct? But I'll give you two big problems after the flood, more than likely that they face. Two big ones. I'm sure there are others. Problem number one, climate change. Don't get scared. I'm not talking about man, the idea of man-induced climate change. I'm talking about God-induced climate change. Last night we talked about the flood. God's purpose with the flood was to kill man and destroy the what? Earth. Earth. Part of the point of the flood was to wreck this world. And as we mentioned last night, before the flood, people would live to be over 900 years of age, but afterwards, just 400, then just 200, then just 100 years of age. They did not live near as long. Why? Because the world was wrecked. It was a junkyard compared to what it used to be like. Right? Not only that, but after the flood, being the perfect time for an ice age, ice age would not be good for dinosaurs as well. Who knows about the plant life after the flood? So lots of reasons. Probably a lot of dinosaurs died out within a few hundred years after the flood because of the environment. But there's even a bigger problem, more than likely, for the dinosaurs after the flood. And this bigger problem is this. People will hunt them. Mm -hmm. you say, people hunt dinosaurs? Absolutely. Think about it. Remember, let's pull this idea back off the shelf. Grab it. I'm putting the fear and dread of you into all the animals, including dinosaurs. So let's say after the flood, after the Tower of Babel, God splits the people into different people groups, spreads them out all over the world. As you migrate to a new area, if you run into a wild herd of chihuahuas, is that dangerous? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> For your ankle, right? <laughs> okay, it's annoying, all right? Not dangerous, but definitely annoying. But if you move to a new area and there are a couple of T Rexes hanging around, is that dangerous? Yes. yes. So, men, what are we going to do? We are going to kill it, right? Because I don't know about you guys, I'm pretty sure I can speak for you on this. I love my wife and my son. And I don't want any critter eating my wife or my son. Amen? Now, I don't care what it is, a bear, a lion, a tiger, a dinosaur, it doesn't matter. We're going to kill it. So the guys, they're going to get together, and they're going to kill the dinosaurs that are a threat. And, of course, other dinosaurs you would kill because it's a lot of food. So man's going to kill dinosaurs to get rid of the menace, to provide food, competition for land, just to show you superior, all that sort of great stuff. And by the way, fellas, let's be honest here. If there were T-Rexes around, 
Who does not want a T-Rex head hanging on their wall? <laughs> right? That's just awesome. You've got to have one of those. And so that's going to be another reason we're going to hunt dinosaurs. The same reason we hunt so many other animals. The exact same reasons why tigers are going to sink to Asia, so forth and so on. You see, really, dinosaurs are not a mystery. They're awesome, they're fascinating, but they're really not a mystery. When you start with God's word, you can answer the skeptical questions of this age and show that God's word is true from cover to cover. And we like to summarize dinosaurs and answers with what we call the seven F's. They were formed on day six. And they were initially fearless before sin, no death, no suffering. But then they were fallen like the rest of the world after kind of sin. And then there was the flood that killed all the dinosaurs not on the ark. Afterwards, they got on the ark. Reproduced, but they faded over time due to other things we talked about, like the climate changes and got induced and a genetic bottleneck and so forth and so on. They were found again, refound, rediscovered in the 1800s. And since that point in time, there's been a whole lot of fiction as to where they came from and where they went. And bottom line for me, I think I like to view dinosaurs as missionary lizards. You say missionary lizards, why? Well, because, number one, when you properly understand them, they confirm that God's word is true from cover to cover. They show you can trust what the Bible says about history. You can trust what it says about salvation. It's a real book of history. It does connect to reality. Not only that, though, when you think of dinosaurs, when you find a dinosaur bone, will you all agree that the bone is dead? Yeah, the bone's dead. The dinosaurs are dead. Why are the dinosaurs dead? Three-letter word. Sin. Sin. You know, the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. You know, and it also says in Romans 3, 20, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you know what? I don't know your hearts here tonight. I hope you all know Christ as Lord and Savior. Uh, but bottom line is we all fall short. And if you don't think you fall short, do me a quick favor. Read that Exodus chapter 20. Read the Ten Commandments. And then recognize that God is perfect and holy and requires perfection to enter heaven with him. It can't be around sin. So you must keep every one of those perfectly to get to heaven. And then recognize this. On top of that, he sees your thoughts and your heart and your motives. And those must be perfect as well. You can never have a straight thought, a lustful thought, a selfish thought, a selfish motive. Never, not once, to get that. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's not fair. Nobody can do that. Well, it is fair, but you're right. Nobody can do that. And guys, that is the awful bad news. We all fall short, and we all are without help in and of ourselves. But that's what makes the good news so good, amen? That while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. That if you'll confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus. Make him your Lord, your God, your King. He's the boss. You give your life to him. And believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. And you see what we just did there? We talked about dinosaurs, and we end up with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what apologetics is always all about. Giving answers always make a beeline to the gospel. That's what it's all about. That's why we do this. That's why we need to be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have. If you want more information on this, more stuff, uh, if you want to share some of these answers with friends, well, we've got tons of resources. I want to go through all of them. The answers books do talk about dinosaurs. They do talk about, you know, do, did dinosaurs evolve into birds? What about the fresh tissue? What about, you know, the secular scientists are saying about dinosaurs? Uh, they're in all the different answers books in different ways. There's books like this. This one, Dinosaurs for Kids, goes through the seven F's in detail. It's a phenomenal book, and it has a strong presentation of the gospel at the end. So this book is ideal for grandchildren, for friends, cousins, you know, whatever, to give it to them so they can read it because they love dinosaurs, right? We all love dinosaurs, especially younger kids, and they'll read it, then they get the gospel at the end. It's really powerful. Uh, the book, Dragon, uh, Dragons, Legends and Lore of Dinosaurs, this one's just an incredible book because it's a pop-up and a pull-out. And it's dragons. Is there a better combination? I don't know. All right, so anyway, you can check that out. These for dinosaur, again, for the younger kids. It's also a curriculum if you want for homeschooling. Awesome. Uh, dinosaur Genesis and the Gospel. This one is Ken Ham. Back in the day, we still had brown hair. And then Buddy Davis. And he's singing. It's a great video. There's added animation. Wonderful for kids. And it, again, it goes through answers about dinosaurs and gives the Gospel. It's wonderful about that. The Answers DVDs, we'll talk about dinosaurs. We often talk about dinosaurs in our magazine. I encourage you to check that out. Don't forget the free DVD you get with each year you subscribe. And guys, don't forget, if you want to sign up for our newsletter, please do. It's free. It keeps you abreast of what's happening in our ministry. You can follow us online, Twitter, Facebook, any one of those. Check us out. Some of you are you know, giving us a friend request. We've already, already become friends. Look at that. Isn't it great? And then uh, also, I haven't mentioned this, which is kind of funny or weird, but our website, answersingenesis.org, is an incredible resource for you, free. 
You can go on our website, and there are literally, not figuratively, literally thousands of articles on almost any subject you can imagine related to biblical authority. And they're there for free. And they're some written at a layman level, some are written at a very technical level. You can choose what you want. There are videos that are free on pretty much any topic you can imagine. Go and check it out. It's a great resource for anyone and everyone if you know you need to get some answers and don't have the money to pay for them. That's what it's there for. Um, so we've got all that stuff going on. I'll be back in the back if you got any questions. What we'll do, we're going to uh, close it down for about uh, 20 minutes. We'll have a break for about 20 minutes to uh, do some resources, to get some water. Uh, is there coffee available? Oh, man. I won't talk as fast in the next session. But okay, so <laughs> I'll be slowing down. Uh, that's probably why I did it. So anyway, but uh, we'll do all that, and we'll come back. Let me close this in a word of prayer, and then we'll take a break, and we'll come back in about 20 minutes. Heavenly Father, God, we love you. What a blessing it is uh, to be here gathered uh, with fellow believers who love you or are passionate about your word. And we can talk about who you are, glorify your name, and equip ourselves in obedience to your word to be used by you uh, to reach out to the world around us. God, I pray that you will convict us, and give us passion for your word, and for you, that you will give us a heart for the lost, and that you would uh, just encourage us and, and provoke us, Lord, to equip ourselves to be disciplined, to get those answers, to read, to watch, to share those with our family members and our friends, and most importantly, to share your gospel with boldness to your glory. God, we love you so much. What a blessing it is to be used by you to accomplish your will for your glory for eternity. What a beautiful thought. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.